Well, hello, hello, hello. Oh boy, I did not know you had weather going on up there. Hey, Alicia. Hi, Kiri. Um, <laughs> your daily weather warning is blazing hot outside. Yeah, stay hydrated, most definitely. I just got to look at the radar and see what you got going on there. Oh, and Kiri, I, I know that just west of you, they've been getting all kinds of rain and everything, but it's pulling it from Texas, and you guys are just missing out on that. So I'm sorry about that for you. Um, oh, yeah, Alicia, I see where you got some nasty weather coming up there. We've got, boy, I've got some right to the south of me, and then in Canada, northwest to me. So we're supposed to be getting more storms tomorrow. So we've had a couple nice days today. It stayed um, around 72, 73 Fahrenheit. So it was a beautiful day. Clear skies, slight breeze. I mean, like one of those perfect summer days. It was so nice. Um, who do we have? Patty, hello. Howdy, howdy to you. You're sweaty with the fans in you. Oh, the fans in you. Not quite, but you, they said possible tornadoes. Oh my goodness. Okay. Well, you know, if you have a, a you're in, a, in an apartment, I think. Um, do they have like a storm shelter, basement, or just go to an interior room? See if you can get on the main level or something like that. So um, Shady Hill, good evening to you. Hello. Um, yeah, he's be real careful with that and, um, with the weather. So I've been through a number of tornado warnings around here this summer. So I totally get you. We had, um, what, what day was it? Saturday? Is that when I was down there? Yeah. Saturday we had more, um, it went right to the south of me, but it was still very serious. So um, anyway, you're in a three-bedroom townhouse. Your laundry room is separate with a door and no windows. Okay, that'll be good. That'll be good to be there. Um, so what has everybody been up to this last week? My garden is growing. It's like I still have a couple things left to put in there. Um, my onions, still hardening them off. Um I've got to trim them down one more time. Part of it is, is that there's a corner of the bed that has a lot of ants and um, aphid um, pods, whatever you call it, the little, the little uh, <laughs> larva shells that, that hold all the little aphids that the, that the ants collect and bring into their their underground home. So there's a corner of it that I need to treat before I bring the onions into that bed. So I've just been between time and uh, weather. I just haven't been able to really get out there. So trying to get there. Now tomorrow's supposed to rain again, but I don't know, maybe I can get out there tonight. So anyway, what I want to do is create a mixture of borax and baking soda, add a little water to make a paste, and then put it around the outside of my bed on the ground, you know, just like here's the <laughs> here's the beds, you know, and just do it right around the outside there in that corner. And then dig down in the dirt um, in that corner on the inside of it and put a bunch down there and then maybe some vinegar too. And just see what that borax and baking soda with vinegar poured on top. It'll probably blow up my garden. <laughs> I don't know. The soil will just be like going everywhere. But um, anyway, they were a problem last year. It was the first year I had them. And they killed off a lot of my peppers that were in that bed. So I do need to treat it and get rid of them. So I think there are a couple other areas of my garden that the ants are starting to find. So... Um, yeah, just 
trying to do that. Uh, the borax and baking soda mix will kill them off like crazy. So um, I don't want to spray insecticides in there or anything like that. But um, but that should work out pretty well. Who else do we have here? Oh, Patty. T oh, that must be Mac and Patty on tonight. Woohoo. You're taking a break from the heat. Good for you. <laughs> Come in the big screen TV. Hello. <laughs> That's all I need to know, right? It's like, I'm on this 59 inch or 56 inch TV. <sighs> Let me join you in your living room, right? Uh, um, <laughs> oh, Grammy Karen, hello. How are you, Donna? Yes. Good to see you. So glad that you're here. So we just need, I know um, Julie can't make it tonight, uh, Heaven's Essentials. So, um, so all we need is Dave, right? <laughs> Dave needs to join us. And then I think I've got all my blue people. So uh, 65 inch. <laughs> oh, oh my goodness. Well, thank you. Um, I'm famous. <laughs> hey, Eli, good evening to you. You've been trying to build a wall using rocks. Good for you. Branches, rusted chicken wire, boards from your Today is the first day in weeks. So ducks haven't gone next year. Kiri, I'm so proud of you. That's so great. I mean, you've got so many natural materials right there. It's just the, I know, it's the work and the effort that it takes to get that all done. So, um, oh, I hear you. I hear you. So, um, but anyway, yes, my tomatoes are taking off well, the plants. Everything is going to be a little bit later and everything. I had a uh, plumber over Thursday, Friday, 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 I think it was. And he was working on some well stuff. And anyway, um, he looked at the garden and he goes, when did you plant? <laughs> I said, just last week. He goes, oh, okay, because everything looks kind of small. It's like, yep, I'm about six or seven weeks behind here but um like i said i planted a lot of things that were just shorter term and so hopefully they will mature in time so um, this is that son of yours isn't working too well. oh i know jen and zach just work hard all the time i think except when they're in in uh, gatlinburg <laughs> Well, the neighbors are happy to give you their garbage. Oh, okay. Probably you're talking about the chicken wire and the boards and all that kind of stuff. Yep. Well, you know, whatever helps build it, that'll work out great for you. The ducks have been driving you crazy. Oh, you planted beans twice? Oh, no. Is something eating them? I mean, because right now they should be sprouting within a couple days. It's so warm. Um, however, we do have a little cooler week this week. Our highs are in the 70s and our lows are in the 50s. Um, but then next week it warms up again, close to 90. So it's just, uh, just a week that kind of reminds us, like, actually, I think it's not a reminder that we're in the north, but I think it's more of a reprieve for us to know that we aren't southerners here. <laughs> so it's like, okay. You don't have to deal with the 90s for so long here. Patty, you're redoing your walkways. Oh, wow. That's a lot of work. That is a lot of work. Um, yeah, Donna, I don't I don't know. Maybe um, have you over fertilized it for the beans or do you have pest problems? Do you, have you seen a lot of birds in there trying to get the seeds or something? Um, because beans really, the only time I have not had beans germinate at all is when it's been so cold. I plant them too early and then we get some cold weather and rain and cold rain and different things that it's just not warm enough for it to grow. So I'm sorry to hear that. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so um, yeah, oh, the only thing that just is not doing well are the blueberries when they planted them in the garden. So uh, all the leaves have 
um, turn their fall color and some are falling off. And I don't know if, I mean, the root systems were good. So I'm just hoping that maybe those will keep the plant alive and come back. So anybody who's done blueberries before, uh, let me know because I know it's kind of, they're kind of finicky to get started, but once they are established, they're really good. But um, hmm. so everything else has sprouted. Nova Scotia is the new Florida. Hot summers are now the norm, 90s and over 100s. Wow. Yeah, you just, uh, you're just getting a warm wave there on the coast, aren't you? I hear you. So, um, alrighty. Well, <laughs> uh, yeah, those 90s, absolutely. Past few days has actually been below 100. Good for you, Kiri. You know, last year was a, a hot, dry summer for you, too. So I hope it's not <clears throat> an indication like that the desert is growing and morphing more into things. So, um, oh, good point, Eli. Good point. So, yeah, Donna, are they fresh seeds? That would be uh, something to to uh, think about. However, the seeds that I planted this year were three-year-old seeds, I think, and I got probably 95% germination, I would say. Um, almost everything germinated there. So there he is. Hello, Dave. You just bought them this year. Okay. Hmm. Well, that was a good point, Eli. I'm sorry. Yeah, I scoot my chair up here. Um, Dave, how are you doing? I, uh, if you guys haven't checked this out, Dave just built a compost bin, and it's like, it's like everything else you do, Dave. It's like, you know, you've got this chicken mansion. It's a compost bin. It's beautiful, and I know it's gonna. You build things to last a long time, and. Um, so you're dodging thunderstorms. Uh, yep. So you guys check out Dave's uh, video if you can after we're done with me here tonight. <laughs> but yeah, he did a beautiful job. Really, really nice. And um, you yeah, know, burning your boards. And not only is so the so shiggy bond, it's just not a great preservation method, but it looks so nice. I mean, it looks like you've stained everything so wonderfully, you know, wild, uh, wonderful off grid. They did their whole house. It looks like it's all stained, but it's not, it's just burned boards. So um, it's just absolutely neat what they do. So, Patty, your garden is needing better soil. You're trying hard to keep things going this year and plan better for next year. You know, it, it's always, um, gardening, it's always thinking almost the year ahead. It's like, what am I doing now to make things better for next year? You know, it's like once you pull a crop out of a bed, what can you add to it to, uh, to help it out for the next crop, right? So whether you put, you grow something different in it or, um, you know, mulch it real heavily or fertilize, compost, whatever you do to it. So the garden is suffering a bit this year. Soil needs love. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how one season of growing can take so much out of a soil because you, you work it and you work it and you add to it and everything. And it's like, okay, it's great. And you have a good growing year and you think that that's going to, um, sustain it for the following year and it just doesn't so um yeah it's kind of a perpetual thing in there oh get some bunnies good for you that'll be some good fertilizer too so um all right i kind of want to talk about how um how we can incorporate perennials into our vegetable garden we you know as 
as gardeners who put up food and different things like that, you, we don't often think about anything other than the perennial planting. You know, like, okay, I've got to start from seed with the tomatoes. I've got to get plants, you know, peppers and carrots and beans and all of the, the usual things. But there's a real benefit at um, incorporating annuals into your the landscaping of your garden um, and it does take some planning because you have to figure out it's like okay you don't want to just plunk them willy-nilly through your garden you know because it's like it could really mess up with where you're putting your trellises where you're putting other beds you know all that kind of thing um, as well as maybe something is going to get so big um, it's like you don't want to put a raspberry patch right in the center you know, or, or maybe you do and then just put everything else around it. But um, so it really makes a difference in what you want to grow, where you put it and everything. So, again, it does take a little bit of planning in that way. So um, um, you planted some perennials today. Awesome. Rosemary, thyme, garlic, chives, chives. Oh, good for you. So some herbs. Um, you know, and we think of perennials mostly in the term of herbs for a garden and everything, but there's so many different things. Um, first of all, a perennial. So we've got perennials and annuals. An annual is a seed or plant that lasts for that season only for that year, right? Just for that one year. Now, most of the things that we get from seeds, um, well, it'll say on there perennials or annuals. Um, I would say the majority of your herbs can be perennials um, and that type of thing. So you made a mistake with your marigolds. You grew the tall ones instead of the... <sighs> yes, the tall ones can get really tall and bushy and take over everything. Yes, absolutely. So, but a perennial plant is a plant or a flower that is simply a plant that lives for more than two years. So it can be a two year plant. We still consider it perennial. We probably call it more of a biennial. So like a two year type thing biennial, but truly we just classify them as annuals and perennials. Um, so a perennial will usually die off during the fall and winter and then return in the spring from the roots. So most of the time you need to cut them back down, you know, cut off all of the, the old foliage and the whatever and um, cut them back down because they grow back up from the root itself. Um, so, um, but most annuals now will bloom for a long time, but when they die out, you have to remove them and then replant them the next season. And uh, so here, Kiri, in North Texas, there are some annuals and biennials that will continue to grow if there's a warm winter and if they are hardy and pampered during the winter. In other words, you know, covered and taken care of and mulched out and all that kind of thing. But the, the thing is that here, um, not only in the States, but in Europe too, um, I'm sure Canada, that we grow so many perennials as annuals. And so I think that can re get really costly, you know, if you're continuing to purchase plants or, you know, doing seeds over and over and over again as annuals when they really could be a perennial. So start thinking, <laughs> uh, Alicia, not for me either. We don't have the warm winters. So, um, but anyway, there's a thing called uh, perennial agriculture. Now, it's not really the same as your little backyard garden, but just to kind of give you an idea, uh, perennial agriculture um, can include perennial grains, oil seeds. So you're talking like canola oil, sunflower oil, probably things like that, um, and legumes, as well as forages and trees. And they can actually take everything to the next level for productivity um, and keeping the ecosystem going and all the services and stuff like that. So um, some, some of those can be harvested numerous times up for up to 10 years 
for crops and much longer for forages, shrubs, and trees. Um, building um, a perennial agricultural system uh, is helps to integrate your perennials into your annual system. You know, and it's like, so there's a lot of things that are such a benefit with that. Um, you know, like, let's say you have, um, there's a perennial, um, there's, uh, it's a type of parsley, lettuce, celery type of thing. So anyway, it's called lovage, which is a strange name. But anyway, so there's a perennial there. And that can pop up right away in the spring and start giving you some fresh greens while your other seeds are starting to sprout and to grow, whether it's your lettuce or parsley or whatever it is. Now, parsley itself can be um, a perennial, at least a two-year plant, depending on your zone, too. But um, um, it's exactly what you're trying. Awesome. That's great, Dave. Yeah, to try to incorporate the perennials that will come up right away so that you don't have to wait until July for things to start um, producing. You, They pop up. So in May, you can start getting that food already. And so it's creating a perennial agriculture in your garden. And you can, it can be, you know, 100 square feet. It could be 100 acres, <laughs> whatever, you know. So it can be um, a huge thing or whatever, but it provides more consistent, abundant, and affordable food. Uh, it can also provide feed, you know, for animals, um, fiber, and even fuel, you know, if, if you get like um, straw from something or, you know, the plants die back or whatever it is, and you can, you can actually have some things to help with, with your fuel. Um, anyway, it's, it's something to really start thinking about, um, especially with, you know, if there's a shortage on seeds, if there's, um, you know, shortage of food, you just want to be able to have this diversity in what you're doing. So you need way more plants. So, <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Um, you know, and it does take some room and some space in your gardening area to make sure you've got perennials out there. You might want to even have them sectioned off. So it's like, this is the perennial garden. This is the annual garden or, you know, however things work for you. Um, hey, Christina, long time. Hello from Oakland. Uh, how is the West Coast? Got a couple West Coasties here. Um, you could be in Mexico before the sun sets. Oh, that's getting starting to get sooner, isn't it? Um, so um, some of the benefits for having perennials, and I'll go through um, like what some perennials are that you could actually grow. And I do have a link in the show notes below for um, for perennials by the zone. So if you're in zone six or something, it's got a certain list of them that uh, perennial vegetables that could be grown. So um, if you're wondering, it's like, well, what can I grow in my zone? What was what would work here? So um, so anyway, you just moved seven days ago. How did the move go? I know that that was a huge thing for you. So <laughs> you rhubarb. Yes, rhubarb is definitely one. So some of the benefits here is that perennials help to maintain your soil cover. So you're not like, um, you know, turning up the, the structure, you know, pulling everything up, having to go to bare dirt again. It's there. Um, it, it strengthens the soil. It uh, creates a better um, bio system under there. They have deeper root systems than annuals. And so they provide the, like I said, the stability for your soil. Um, it creates a better soil health to have a perennial in there. They also can tap available soil nutrients and um, they end up making more water available to plants. And um, it says that, you know, like in a lot of things like trees, you know, that um, in order to get new varieties of, say, apples, 
Um, what they do is they'll take a, a branch from one variety of tree and then graft it to the, um, the trunk of another type of tree. And that's how they get these new varieties. So in a way it's a hybrid, but um, they, they produce all these different things. So what they try to do is get the benefits from one, um, adding to the benefits the other, make a, a heartier apple, a sweeter tasting apple, or whatever it is that they're looking for. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Now, another thing that they try to do is, for some other perennials, is that they will go and get they, the, the plant scientists, <laughs> you know, the, the ecologists, um, that we can, and you can even do this yourself too, but go into the wild and um, let's say, um, what would be a good grafting one? I'm just thinking of asparagus, but not really. Um, but well, I guess just a tree, okay, apple tree. If there's a wild um, crab apple tree or something like that, and you want to get a uh, little sweeter tasting crab apples or incorporate it into a honey crisp tree, although I don't know why you ruin a honey crisp tree. But anyway, it just I'm just just showing you something. But anyway, whatever is growing wild in your area, in your climate, is going to be so much stronger and um, more resistant to pests, greater adaptation to your climate and everything than something that you would go and buy at the nursery or something. And so incorporating the wild things into your garden. If you can go out into the woods or something, dig something up and then plant that into your perennial space, it's going to survive so much better because it's already adapted to all of your, your area, to your soil, to your weather, to everything like that. So pear trees graft well. Okay, that's great. Um, your city monk box is great news. There's an established veggie bed to fruit trees. <gasps> nice, Christina. So good. So elderberries are wild there. Yes. By nematode resistant rootstock. Okay, good point. Um, but yeah, if, and I know there's some areas where you can't dig up elderberries or even harvest from them. I don't know why. Well, I guess we know why. But anyway, yes, if there's an area where you can... Um, you know, just find what is growing around you and uh, and then see if it's something that you want to grow, if you want to transplant it, whether it's asparagus or wild lettuce or, um, you know, uh, berries. If there's, you know, uh, wild, wild blueberries or wild blackberries or something like that, you know, that you can do that. So, um you know, just bring them, bring them home, dig them up and bring them home. Um, if you're able to go out into a woods where either from somebody who owns land that you know or something and they have tons of like new little trees and you need some trees, uh, whether it's like a pine tree or, a, um, you know, a deciduous tree or something like that, that um, you want to get a maple tree growing in there instead of going and paying 50 or $75 at a nursery for a tree, go out and see if you can dig that up and transplant it into your place. So um, you made baked apples with them, they're so good. Um, yeah, so for uh, crab apple jelly um, jams, things like that. Um, uh, yeah, Christine, I hear you. Yeah, space is kind of a, a different, definitely a big thing. So um, perennials require reduced fertilizer. So those of us who are growing annually um, in beds and stuff like that, you know, like Dave said, his soil is depleted from last year. It's like we have to continue to fertilize, continue to to um compost continue to modify and amend that soil it, it, it's like an annual thing it's a working working deal but perennials require far less work in that area um you can you know continue to mulch them every year you might have to um you know once a year maybe 
put a little fertilizer around them or something, depending on what they need. But because their roots go so deep, they're tapping into all those extra nutrients down there. And so um, that's great. Whether it is a plant in your garden, whether it's a bush or whether it's a tree, those are all perennials. So, um, and we'll go through some of those things. So, so because you have less fertilizer, um, it takes you far less energy to keep them up. Um, you have some trimming, harvesting, different things like that, but it's like you're not pulling them up, pulling them up and reworking the soil every year, all that kind of thing. So, so your financial investment is far less. Yes, you might pay, you know, $50 for a plant to start with or whatever, um hopefully it's a lot less <laughs> but um or like i said go and dig it up for free somewhere but um your investment is just initial in that way and but if you're doing annuals it's like every year you're having to either um you know if you're not saving seed you're having to buy new seed or buy new plants and everything so over the long run you're um you're spending a lot more and the um, energy that you go into doing that. So, so um, they said that one example now on a bigger scale for farmers or something is a perennial wheat. I did not know wheat could be a perennial, but there is. And it offers forage for feed early in the season, a grain crop for food for animals and everything, and then straw or hay for biofuel. Um, and they've done that actually in Australia. So um, they grow this perennial wheat. And so it it continues to grow. So the seasons will go around and you never have to continue to, um, you know, plow up that ground and then plant something different. And so it's, it's better for the soil. You start getting all of the um, the microbes and all of the, the worms and all of the good stuff that loves to live in a soil that is not disturbed in that way. And so that makes for a healthier soil too. Um, having and or perennials also reduces the need for pesticides and herbicides as a general rule. Now there will be some that will get attacked, but as a general rule, um, they're usually like I said, adaptive to your area. Um, it, most bugs and everything like the the new little plants that come up and the fresh greens that are in your garden and, and they go for that rather than go for a rhubarb leaf or, a, um, you know, the tree or something like that. And so, or in bushes. Oh, Grammy Karen, thank you. Um, I do a lot of research, so it's not just my own knowledge here. It's like I'm passing on information. Um, so some perennial vegetables. So I'm going to break it up between vegetables, fruits, and herbs. So think of those three different groups that, that you can plant for perennials. So we have vegetables, fruits, and herbs. And, um, you know, you're not going to like everything, obviously, but... Uh, Oh, thanks, Karen. Appreciate it. Um, and again, some of these, this list is just going to be kind of whatever is growing out there. Doesn't mean that it will actually grow in your zone. So make sure you check out the link that, um, let me see if I can give it to you really quick here. Uh, zones. There you go. Um, if you check that out, it, it's kind of a long article, but towards the end at the bottom, it'll, it'll kind of list everything by zones. Um, so there, I have one, two, three, four, five, seven links this time on growing perennials. And then a couple of them, I guess, are zones and all the benefits and the different things like that, things that you can grow, which is kind of fun. Um. There you oh, Dave's got a lot of room. <laughs> okay, some perennial vegetables you can grow. Everybody kind of knows this one, asparagus. So people think that, oh, that's the only one I can grow is asparagus. Um, you're welcome, Christina. There's artichokes or sunchokes, depending on, you know, the variety you get. So artichokes actually can grow in zone three. 
I did not know that. Zones one through three. So um, if you like artichokes, you can grow them in the north. Kale. There's a certain variety of kale that can be um, a perennial. Who knew? Right. And in some of these, it depends on, again, your zone. And it depends on, like I said, your climate. So that if you have it in a bed, you may need to cover it well, mulch it well during the winter for it to survive over and everything like that. So, um, you know, there's a lot of things. So garlic can actually be a perennial. Um, I'm not sure how that works, but they said that it can be. Dandelions, of course, as we know, um, grow year after year. And again, lovage, like you said, it's a member of the parsley, carrot, or celery family, or and or celery family. So it, it's got the leaves, it's got a stem like a celery. It's got leaves that look like parsley, like flat parsley. Um, and they said it, it's got really good um, flavor to it, more so than celery and everything. So I'm going to have to check that out sometime and see if that's something I can grow. Um, radicchio, radicchios, <laughs> kind of like a radish, but a red, red, oh my goodness, I don't know why I can't say it to radicchio. Okay, horseradish is another one. Watercress, a Swiss chard. Um, I don't know that that would work in my zone, but I know in the warmer zones, um, six, seven, eight, uh, it can keep coming up every year. Um, sorrel, broccoli, and spinach, uh, some varieties of them can come up. And again, according to your zone, sweet potatoes. How about that? That would have to be in the warmer zones. Um, radicchio, um, close. It's R-A-D-I-C-C-H-I-O. There you go. Um, something I'm not familiar with these are called tree cabbages and then tree collards. So collards and cabbage, but they're, they're a variety of the tree cabbage. So I don't know if they specifically grow near a tree or what it is. So Lovage pesto. Ooh, that would be good. They said it's much more flavorful than, than like I said, parsley and celery and stuff. So um, there's a good flavor to it. Um, wasabi can be a perennial. Dave, your, your garden is just going to be so diverse. Uh, really good. And yams, well, yams are like sweet potatoes. So, um, you know, um, they didn't really describe how to grow them as a perennial because we're used to taking them and digging them up, digging everything up. So I imagine maybe just digging up the tubers, but leaving some of the greens in the ground and then that would grow some more. Um, hi, Patty, how are you? Uh, both a bit aggressive, so a bit, oh, um, maybe put them in, you'd have to build kind of a contained bed or something, Dave, probably. Um, I even see putting them in like a, um, a metal trough or something. I don't know, sink it, sink it into your ground, put it in a big trough and just have them grow in there. Um, Patty, you said you grew tree collard for a couple years. They're cool plants and tasty. You sold it when you moved. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Some, you know, things like, you know, if you don't want mint, uh, especially because mint is very invasive, um, you know, most of them are, uh, you'd want to put them in some kind of contained area or something like that too. But, okay. So those are some of the perennial veggies. Um Didn't think due to the drought you get a prickly pear, but you're seeing green fruit growing. <gasps> nice. Oh, so good, Kiri. That's so great. So now some perennial fruits and people are like, oh, well, what can I grow? You know, do you think up here at least they're like well, raspberries or rhubarb. Everything's just rhubarb. So it's like asparagus and rhubarb. Those are the only perennial plants we can do. <gasps> well, um, 
as it is, I showed you, or, you know, went through all these other vegetables so you can grow as a perennial. Yep, strawberries. So we have rhubarb, raspberries, strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, currants. And then, then we um, go to like the trees and the bushes. So those are, you know, things that are just plants in your garden and everything else. But then we go to the, the uh, bushes and trees. So we have cherries, apples, pears, peaches, apricots, elderberries, goji berries, huckleberries, lemons, limes, oranges, grapefruit, persimmons, plums, um, pomegranate, avocado, dates, figs, grapes, kiwi, um, nuts, and olives. I mean, there's just like so many things that you can do with the fruits and well, and the, some of the nuts and everything too. I just put nuts as one category because there's how many nut trees out there, but um, you have a hask, app, or honeyberry and cranberry too. Yes, cranberries. So yeah, believe me, I, I didn't reach nearly all of the berries that were available there for that, but uh, those are, thanks Patty. Um, so honeyberries are nice low bushes. Oh, okay. Um, honeyberries taste similar to blueberries, only sweeter. Mm, I might have to try that. If, if my blueberries don't take, and it wasn't a big investment. I think I paid 11 or $12 for two bushes. So, um, if, if they don't recover and I probably just took too long to get them in the ground this year. Um, but yeah, so it's just, these are all fruits that continue to come back year after year after year. And <clears throat> excuse me, the, um, you know, you just think of a, it, these are not just for making jam. <laughs> so you don't have to think it's like, okay, I'm going to have 25 varieties of jam on my shelves, uh, 25 jars of each variety. It's like, I can't eat that much jam, you know? You can can the fruits, you can uh, dehydrate them, freeze them, uh, freeze dry them, you know, all kinds of different ways to preserve them as well as eating them fresh. So, and as far as like lemons and limes and oranges, um, certainly in the South, you're able to grow the full tree or even a dwarf tree, but it, um, you know, you have your full size fruit trees there. But in the North, we can have like a even a miniature tree in a pot that can even stay inside during the winter and everything. So um, there's so many different ways you can get it. You know, of course you don't get the volume that you would normally get, but um, it's, you know, it's definitely out there. Um, <clears throat> I got my blueberry plants. Where did I get them? Again, them at any of the, um, any of the greenhouses, um, you know, at any of the big box stores or something like that. I don't know if you can purchase them online. Well, you probably can. Um, yeah, like, uh, I know Emma Gardner does a lot of the plants. So, yeah, just uh, search around for those. A bit of fresh fruit jam makes it. That is so true, Christina. That is true. Um, but yes, making syrup from things. Um, it's a nursery. Oh, thank you. One green world. And there's another one that I know the, um, the haulers have used and uh, it's something brothers. I can't remember what their, what the name is. Um, I think it begins with an S. And I'm not sure, but anyway, so there, there's a lot of companies out there. Yes, they can provide um, annual or perennial fruit plants, but, you know, go through and pick out, first of all, what you have space for and then what you like to eat and what you want to grow, um, what you're able to grow in your zone. It's like, you know, in Canada, you're not going to grow kiwi or pomegranates, you know, it's just not going to happen. But you can grow um, grapes, you can grow apple trees, cherry trees, you can grow, you know, pear trees, rhubarb, any of the berries, all like Stark Brothers. Thank you, Patty. That's what it was. 
Um, hey, Lisa. Hi. How are you doing? Yes, Stark Brothers is uh, is excellent. Um, so they've got a lot of fruit trees as well as probably could get um, you know other bushes from them and everything. So then there are the herbs, perennial herbs. Um, I've got two different mints and sage and oregano and chives right now. My lemon balm died. Um, and then those are my perennial herbs right now. And they're doing great um, that are in the main garden. The lemon balm I had put on the south side of the house, and I think it just got too hot and too dry there. So I'm going to have to try a different place for those and see if they'll make it through the winter. Um, otherwise, um, you know, when I do like basil and um, parsley, I left in last year and it did not make it through the winter. So my winters are not good for turning parsley into a perennial, but um, I think warmer zones would definitely work for that. Um, so, you know, all those other kind of things. So um, thank you, Karen. Yeah, my lemon balm died, so <clears throat> usually, yeah. So I will try it again next year and get those started and um, get the plants going and get them planted and see what I can do there. So some per perennial herbs that you can plant are the ones, a couple that I have, mints, um, and there's oh, so many different kinds of mints. You have peppermint and spearmint and chocolate mint and uh lemon mint i think and i mean it's just so many different mints you can do so um so in sage and there's even different varieties of sage different flavors of sage too and there's pineapple sage i tried to grow in last year and that it didn't uh well, i wasn't able to tend to it really well either but um it didn't overwinter so um oregano does well uh chives Lemon balm fennel is a good perennial herb. Ginger, lavender, onions. You wouldn't think onions, but there are certain kinds of onions. They call them potato onions or Welsh onions. Um, some shallots, Japanese bunching onions, Egyptian onions, Chinese onions, parsley, and thyme. So those are some good perennial herbs. Uh, basil, there are two different varieties of, ba of basil that you could plant that are perennial. One is an African blue and then an East Asian basil. Those are the varieties that they said. So, um, guys, the chat's moving here. Okay. But some herbs, but you're going to keep them inside the house all the time. Okay. Uh, Moringa trees are superfood, but they do not tolerate the frost. So true. Yeah, we are so many superfoods we can't grow here. So um, a dwarf variety too. Oh, nut. <laughs> Special. Uh, Michigan daffodil, hello. Oh, I hope you're having a good time camping. Are you in northern MI there in the upper... The UP camping. Um, the downside of moringa trees is they grow so tall and so quickly that it shades out other plants. You do agree it's highly nutritious, yes. And so those are some of the things you have to consider about where you put them in your um, gardening space. You know, you want to make sure that you check out how big these things are going to get because they're perennials. They're going to be there until you take the effort to dig the whole thing up. But, um, you know, that's, that's what you have to really take into consideration, that they don't um, shade out what are going to be your other vegetables, your other annuals, and different things like that. So, um, oh, that's good, Patty, because I, I didn't even get a chance to use my pineapple sage, so um, it won't overwinter up north. Okay, well, it's good to know because it didn't. Um, yeah, Maria is a dwarf. That's great. African blue is a gorgeous basil. It should be all purple on the back of the leaf. And it's cutting. Oh, very nice. 
Very nice. Uh, are you glamping in your trailer? Uh, <clears throat> So those are the herbs. So we've got vegetables, fruits, and herbs that you can plant. So um, again, perennials have just a really robust root system. And they said there's a superpower in their root system because you said they draw up all the nutrients from way down deep. And, um, you know, you want to make sure that they get watered properly and just depends in on the on the fruit or vegetable whether it's a tree with really deep roots or not you know that type of thing so but just taking care of it um the one thing is that um a lot of times the first year you won't get um the fruit that you need from them um some strawberries you can get plants you know if you have a like a second year plant that you buy um, you could get strawberries off of those first year or something, but most other perennials, um, asparagus, I know it takes at least a couple years before it'll start growing. Uh, I've not grown it myself, but I know that it takes a while. Um, south of on a lot you bought a camper. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, there you go. <clears throat> that, that happens, Michigan Deptil. Um, so, uh, what was I seeing even? I just lost my train of thought. But anyway, um, yeah, just maintaining it. So, again, perennials require less maintenance every year. Um, you do not need to compost and mulch them every year, just when they need it. Uh, they improve the structure of the soil because they aerate the ground and it channels everything with the roots. And so the water can travel down where the roots are. Um, instead of like having the solid packed soil, the roots have gone down in there. So when it rains or you water, it follows that root system down and gets down there further. So it really, really helps your, your overall soil. And then, um, you know, like, uh, any type of watershed type of thing. If you have more of a hill and you, you're planting trees and shrubs and everything else on that and creating your, your kind of a food forest type of deal, but you are helping the, um, to prevent erosion from going on by, by planting these and getting the roots going deep. So, um, so it'll be so good. Um, that's what I thought it was at least three years to get that, Um, yeah, that's what I thought. For some reason, I thought maybe it was five years, but I think that's a little too long. Um, but uh, three years was kind of a sticky in my mind for the asparagus. Um, so also the root systems, they, they draw up like nitrogen to the surface, which helps the other plants around you and everything. So, um, in a flower bed, if you're now growing flowers or something like that, hardy perennials will actually provide a nice ground cover. So it'll help preserve your moisture. So you don't have bare soil going on. So, you know, oh, a win-win there too. Um, many perennials, as we, uh, a couple of people have mentioned that you can propagate them very easily by dividing them and replanting them. Um, like, um, you know, well, strawberries send out their runners to propagate and different things like that. But others, um, comfrey and uh, I think elderberries and moringa, you know, a lot of those will, you can cut them, you know, dig up part of the and replant it and it'll be just fine. So you're, you're actually taking one plant and extending that out, which is so great. Hey, Debbie, how are you? Um Oh, that's super. That's so great. There's so many ch good channels out there. There really are. Um, thinking of doing some aero aqua type gardening this winter. Nice. Oh, that's super. Um, 
so the system of you know propagating and replanting of digging up the root clump splitting it you know that that makes sure that you have a really long lasting garden so let's say you have um you know i'm just say strawberries strawberries will have a life of three to four years and then you want to really dig those plants up to get the younger ones growing in there so you know after you know after two years of that plant growing you want to make sure that the runners are going out and then establishing those so that they can grow up and start and be a good producer when it's time for you to dig up the old plant and um just because the root system gets overworked and um, it, it just doesn't draw up it, you, the nutrients, they're not as healthy as the younger ones, that type of thing. So you just want to continue to propagate in that way. Um, you do, you know, okay. So I'm sorry, I'm mumbling. I was just reading the, <laughs> reading the chat there. Um, it says, once your perennials are established and if they are suited to your climate and the site conditions, they can be virtually indestructible. Um, so an annual vegetable garden requires, you know, so much more watering and weeding and work to get a good crop. But once established, a perennial vegetable or fruit can often, again, be more resistant to attacks of pests due to the reserves of energy stored in their roots. Um, also the canopies which leaf out can help better suppress the weeds, all that kind of thing. So, oh boy, I still got three pages left here to go. <laughs> Only three minutes. Um, these are kind of repeats though, it looks like. Um, some provide uh, beautiful ornamental type of things. Some are attractive edible landscapes. Some can function as hedges or ground covers or erosion control. Some provide free fertilizer. Some help out with pest control by providing habitat or food for predatory or other beneficial insects. Um, so uh, oh, another thing to kind of the downsides of perennials that once they once they flower they end up becoming better and i'm just thinking of like the herbs um the mints and the like my oregano and stuff like that once they flower then just want to cut back that stem and then it'll grow up some new ones but the um the true flavor in those leaves um is good before it flowers because then it does get bitter in that way so um, strawberry is a great example. Yep. Yeah, Dave, your, your strawberry beds have just expanded like crazy. That's for sure. Um, want to uh, just have a, a quick uh, kind of a fun fact here of um, how we got started with annual agriculture here in North America. It actually started in Europe. Um, that's where most of our gardening traditions came from. Uh, but they did not have very many perennial crops there. Um, the perennial crops really started in the tropical areas like Africa, Asia, Latin America, all that kind of stuff where their agriculture was developed strongly around root and starchy fruit crops as their staples. But they did not grow very well in Europe and um, you know, they, in Europe, they're, they had smaller land plots and everything just because they didn't have the wide open spaces that we do. But they also, um, you know, used oxen to help turn over the soil, all that kind of stuff. So they didn't want to necessarily have to go around all these other plants. And if so, it's like, just dig it all up, plant it every year. And so there were a lot of perennials that they domesticated in our colder and temperate climates that ended up becoming annuals. So, so we've been deceived a lot by saying, oh, these are all annuals. You have to regrow them every year, which we don't. And so um, that's where I just wanna encourage you to do your, do some homework and do some study and figure out what can be perennials for you in your garden so that you don't have to keep planting them over and over again. And you've got a really good 
diverse supply of food for yourself. So um, let me catch up with the chat here. Uh, I use some edible weeds and grass growing. <laughs> there you go. Uh, yep, I had all that in there too. So, all right, guys. Um, tarot and mango. Oh, okay. Yep. So a lot of things, um, you know, they just, uh, yeah, you, you think about domesticating animals, but they domesticated crops in the way of um, taking that that hardiness away from them and made them so much more vulnerable to, to pests and weaker, really. So uh, give back to strong plants in your garden. So anyway, guys. You've been amazing. I appreciate it. It's already seven o'clock here, Central Time. And I'm going to let you go for the night, for the week. But thanks for joining me. I really appreciate it. Thank you to all my moderators. Uh, you guys are amazing. I really appreciate it. Um, you guys are super. All right. You guys take care. God bless. Always have hope. And we'll see you next week. Good night. <laughs>